march from history. Here's what it is. After World War I, veterans who had fought in World War I and survived that, that, that butcher machine were told that they would be given a bonus for having served in the killing fields of Europe. They came home, and the federal government, of course, lied to them, as they always do, and gave them nothing. So the leaders of this bonus group, all veterans, set up camps, tents on the White House lawn. And they encamped on the White House lawn. And guess what happened to them in the 1920s? The President of the United States rewarded them for fighting in World War I by executing them. He sent in army troops to shoot at them. Many of them were shot dead right on the White House lawn. So I said, don't think it started on Ob under Obama. The federal government has always had a fascistic streak in it. And so look back and go research the bonus march. I don't know whether I calmed them down or alarmed them more. But that's the issue of knowing a little bit of history. That's all. 855-407-282. Let's take a few callers. Craig on KSFO. Go ahead, please. The Savage Nation, make your point. Call screener, awake. Not there. Go ahead. Not his fault. Oh, God. WABC David, go ahead. You really want me to answer that on a national show? I'm okay. You know, but my ear hurts. I have a little bit of a toenail. I don't know. You know, this is none. How are you? What's doing in Brooklyn? What? What's wrong with you people? Weren't you told not to ask me how I am? What do you think? I'm eating a pickle with you somewhere in a deli? Next one. Don't ask me how I am. You don't know me. I don't know you, and you don't care. WMAL, Rodney, fire away what's on your mind. Yes, people are analyzing Trump's speech patterns, but, you know, the parallels between Donald Trump and General Patton are uncanny. I, you know, I sent you a book about six months ago about Patton. I had a picture on him. I don't know if he got it or not. But he was a mastermind strategist in, in tank warfare. And I think, you know, to understand Trump is to understand what it means for total victory, what it means to think strategically. And this separates him from the other, from the other candidates. It's how he thinks in a strategic way. And uh, I'm not arguing with you. That's why I, I relate to him. I think the same way. I can tell. I can tell. I, I think the same way. In fact, I don't speak the way he does. I don't speak in short 10-word ten, ten sound bites. But let me tell you something. Whoever analyzed the speech patterns was very, very smart. Uh, in a world of too many words that go on and on and ramble and people don't get the point, it's pretty good to uh, reduce it to simple terms because people can't take it all in. You know, they're not listening for an essay. They want the short answer. Right. That's right. But the, all right. That's it. That's the short, that's the short that's the short answer to that one. We have a couple open lines. I realize many of you got scared away by my outburst, but I've been in radio twenty one years. There's a first rule of talk radio: you never ask a host how he is. How are you? Fine. I'm a first time caller. Great. Wonderful. How are you? Really? Did you get new dentures today? Really? How's the hearing aid? Very good. How are the shoes? Wonderful. Mm -hmm, mm hmm How was your lunch? Great. And what's your point? Well, you know, I wanted to say this, Mike, and uh, no, that's not talk radio. Talk radio is get on, bang, make your point, and get off. If I want to discuss it, I will. I prefer right now till the end of the show, 30 seconds or less. If you're lucky enough to get through Clint, the call screener, wearing a, uh, a green uh, ski hat, in there, you look you look like the Unabomber on the on the screen. It's cold in there. They freeze them out in there. These guys, I don't understand. They're in Dallas and they're freezing in there every day. That's one of the reasons I work at home is I find radio studios you can't control the temperature. Every time I go in, I said, "Let me control." No, your thermostat's eight studios down, <laughs> and it's usually set in the room where there's equipment. And they want it cold to keep the equipment from overheating, and they treat you like you're a piece of equipment in a radio studio. Not to mention that you have to put up with the, the scents and the odors of the people who were in there before you. Don't get me started. I have a whole thing about people who cook in radio studios. He's pointing at something. What, a boss just came by and said, don't say anything? What, I should put my hat on? I, I can't see the screen. What? I don't know what you're saying. Waving at me. KSFO, Mike, what's on your mind? He may have been telling you not to talk to me. Uh, I wanted to, uh, I have two, two issues, but since you want it quick, we'll make it one. 
Uh, the uh, Boston Globe on the 11th had an interesting interview with San Francisco's own Larry Tribe, who, who was common law professor for both Obama and Tribe. And Tribe is honest. He's a, he's, he's a left-winger, but his comment was that when he was, um, I'm paraphrasing, I'm not going to read it, uh, that he used to argue with Cruz and his class, which he always enjoyed. And, and uh, at the time, Cruz was a, uh, call it an originalist, and believed in the original intent of the Constitution, where Tribe believes it's a living Constitution. And he's, uh, he, he, he's calling him a hypocrite, because he's, sending, he, he, he's advocating for just the opposite, where, where, in fact, Congress determines who's natural-born. And I think, uh, I think that... Uh, that well, well, let's slow down. People can't right follow you. I think, I think I can. Larry Tribe is a diehard fanatical left-wing fanatic. I use the fanatical word twice. He's a double fanatic. To be honest, do you agree? You agree he's a liberal, right? A left winger. Absolutely. Hey, okay. So naturally, he hates he hates Cruz because Cruz is not a left winger. I mean, let's not get carried away here. No, but he uh, he uh, well, you you don't know because he's been he's being blatantly dishonest about a few issues and being having some having legal training and being a smart guy. Uh, Trump is is going to be at a disadvantage if he gets into the the weeds around legal issues. And uh, many people probably wisely are avoiding Okay, now you're making a salient point. I know another very smart young man who made a, a fortune on his own. And he said he doesn't need to know all the details. He leaves that to people he hires. And, of course, that's where Cruz triumphs because lawyers specialize in details. But we don't need a detail man of that nature running the country. They'll get caught themselves in their own detail. The fact is, is it's good to know what's going on and hire good people. He said he would hire a patent to run the Defense Department. What more do we need to know? We have to find out what, how tall uh, the guy is who's going to run the Defense Department, how big his nose is, and how many bullets he can fire a minute? Yep, I absolutely agree. All right, so you see, I boiled it down. Thank you. You, you made your point in your own way. On the Internet, Sarah, a woman finally calls the show. Sarah, go ahead, please. You're one of the 22 uh, Savagettes who listen to this show. What's on your mind, Sarah? Hi, Dr. Savage. Thank you so much for taking my call. I'm a huge fan of yours. I listen to you every day. Um, the reason I called was I heard you say that you didn't trust um, Ted Cruz, and I feel completely the same. I feel like he's preaching to us. I feel like he's like a TV evangelist when he talks, and he just, I don't, there's something about him. I just, I don't know. But Trump, you know, he comes across, I trust him. I think he's going to do great things, and uh I think this is the salient point here, is that in a general election, Trump will garner more votes than Cruz. That, that being said, it doesn't mean that I'm running Cruz down. It's not for him or against him. I don't think Cruz can win. I don't think he's trustworthy to the general public. He has a certain kind of oiliness about him. I agree. I totally agree with when you. I, when I look at him very carefully, I'm sorry, make believe I'm a casting director. I look at the political stage. I say to myself, I'm a movie director. What would I cast Cruz as? I put him in a Dracula movie. He looks like almost sinister in a certain way. So that doesn't diminish his value as, as a candidate or as a human being. He's just not as electable as Trump. Trump will... Trump will... <laughs> Trump will... Trump will <coughs> sorry. Trump will doesn't come across that way. Why do you think so many people suddenly like a, a billionaire? That's very unusual unto itself. Most people resent rich people. How come they don't resent Donald Trump? Why is that? Because he's a leader, and we're tired of Obama and his weakness. I mean, we want someone who's going to stand up for us. And, he and you know, more women, I know women, some, who, some of whom have built businesses on their own. They're very macho women, very strong-willed, very smart. They all say Donald Trump is the last hope we have for America. They don't like Cruz at all. These are smart women. One of them is even liberal-leaning. She likes Trump. And there's a reason. It's America is desirous of an alpha male. I don't believe Cruz comes across as an alpha male. I believe he comes across, I would say, as a, a beta male. He would be a fabulous lieutenant for a general or a colonel for a general. He is not a general. And I think that's what people are seeing. They want a dominant male because we need that to face the world right now. I think that's what you as a young woman are saying, right? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so you want strength. In plain English, boiling it down to ten words or less, you like Trump because he, rep he presents strength strength to you, and you don't feel that Cruz is as strong 
uh, in, in his being. I think that's what you're saying. We don't have to run Cruz down to say that, do we? No. No, no, no. No, and that's what I'm saying because I believe that when Trump wins the nomination and when he wins the election, where do you think he would turn for his cabinet and his chief uh, enactors of his policies? He would certainly turn to that stage. Every one of those people on that stage is a fabulous person in their own ways. Every one of them. Doesn't mean you have to destroy them before the election is over so there's nothing left. See, this is what, what's happened. Is you're e we're eating our own now. We're letting the media dictate the terms of this election. We're falling into the trap of thinking that we have to chop people to death on our own side in order to win the election. It's insanity. That's because most people who are doing this don't think long term and they don't have strategic thinking. Strategic thinking means think way ahead. Think to the election and beyond. Do you want a weakened Trump, a Cruz? No. Do you want to destroy Trump? No. Do you want a mashed up Bush? No. We don't want any of that. What we want is a cabinet of many of these men. I think Carly Fiorina would be fabulous in commerce, for example. I can name where they, each of them would play a great role. Ben Carson would be great in the in the Department of Health and Human Services, HHS. I mean, I would hire him in a minute. I'd make him, uh, where I'd have him work for me in 10 seconds. I'll be back in a minute. Well, as this show comes to a conclusion, we have only a couple of minutes left. How do I summarize what's going on in the world today? We have a party fighting amongst itself, egged on by people in the media to continue fighting and bloodying each other, which I think is foolish, and I've said so. We have a media star, Megyn Kelly, who is in it only for herself, and Donald Trump said, thank you very much, but no thank you. I'm not going to be ripped apart by you again. And I take some credit for him deciding not to go there. He may change his mind by tomorrow. He's probably negotiating with Rupert Moloch right now where he's saying, here are the questions. She's not allowed to set me up. If she does, you're going to write here that Fox owes me $50 million. I, mean, I don't know what he's doing. We don't call each other up and talk about lettuce. But I would think if he's a negotiator, that's what he's saying. Okay, you want me on for that $75, $7 million a minute or whatever you're going to make? Fine, here's the money. She sets me up, it's $50 million if she asks this question. That has teeth in it. That's a negotiation. That's how it works. I'm sure he's glad to answer questions, but not to be set up as the devil by uh, Megan Blood in the Eyes Kelly. So anyway, that's what I think is going on. And my dog, Ted, so far is fine. I have a little video of him. He's come out of anesthesia and out of the dental work, and he's walking around over there, and Irene's going to go get him just as the show is over and bring him home, and I'm going to have to you know, cook him soft food. I, I look forward to taking care of him all night tonight, frankly. I'm alone here with the dog, and I'm going to talk to him about it. And that's it. That's life. And tomorrow is another big day, isn't it? Thursday something. Oh, the debate. I forgot. Right. That's my whole life now. It's really not my whole life. It's not my whole life. No. You'll forget all of this in a few months. There's more in the world than a debate. Okay. Thanks for listening. The Zika virus is here, but pay no attention to it. Uh, don't worry about it. Obama's in charge. And the CDC will tell you what not to do. Savage.